The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. It is Smart Guy Wednesday. We've never had Chuck Klosterman on Smart Guy Wednesday. Maybe because we've only had like four or five Smart Guy Wednesdays. But now he's here from Grantland.com. Noted author. Noted thinker. Noted lots of things. Hey, Chuck. How are you? Hey, how did this Smart Guy moniker come about for Wednesdays? Well, how did that happen? You know, I don't know. I think we, it was because, I think we had Zach Lowe and like Barnwell as back or shots or somebody as back to back guests. And I called it smart guy Wednesday. And then we thought it would be funny to just have a smart guy Wednesday. And every week we have a smart guy on a Wednesday. Very flattering to be called smart guy. Mm. So you just did a huge piece for us on Grantland about Royce white and his philosophies on mental illness. Royce white is I, I don't know what to make of him anymore. He's certainly one of the most fascinating athletes in a while. I think he's he's partly full of crap. I, I think he's partly um you use the word brilliant. Some of the things he says does make me feel like, wow, this is some of the most insightful stuff I've heard an athlete say in a while. I don't well, know what to make he, of the he guy. Kind of see, I said he kind of seems like a brilliant ninth grader who had just sort of written a piece on, or like a, a, like a, a research paper on mental illness and maybe read a book by Karl Marx, now is sort of obsessed with that content. I don't, you know, that said, he was certainly, I would say of the athletes I've interviewed, the most articulate and the most thoughtful in terms of being able to think about his life outside of sports. Um, now, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 it was a very tricky, I kind of felt tricky writing it because, you know, you have to be very careful how to reflect. When someone's dealing with a problem like mental illness, you have to be very careful how they are represented. I mean, I just tried to be fair to him, I guess. I would say calling him a brilliant ninth grader would have made him one of the top 10 smartest NBA players. How about that? <laughs> um, yeah, it was a tricky column. And, and I, I think that was part of the fun of it was because. I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer to this whole Rice White thing, and I do think it seems like he kind of wants it both ways. He he wants to be an NBA player. He wants to get paid like an NBA player, but wants a different set of circumstances for himself than what basically everybody else has. And is he entitled to that? I, I don't know. Like, Because as you point out in the piece – where does this go? Does this lead to 150 players deciding they're entitled to this? Where do we draw the line? Does now do we have to have 50 buses? Like, where does this end? And I think that's what I left that piece with. Like, I don't know how this gets resolved. Well, you see, you know, I went down there with the idea that I was just going to do a piece about the relationship between sports and mental illness. At one point, I'd want to kind of build this story around um, uh, the pitcher Gunther Willis. Remember him? Yep. Yeah, you know, he had uh, some mental illness issues that essentially seems like they either contributed to or ended his career. He never wanted to, to conduct an interview, though. He, at one point, he was sort of like, well, I'll do the interview uh, after I make it back to the major leagues. And then he never did. So then he was like, why do it at all? So I thought, well, okay, here's a new guy. He's pretty upfront about talking about mental illness. He will be a good sort of uh, vortex for the story. But Ten minutes into it, it just became clear to me that his ideas had not been examined by the other sources who had written stories about him. That they all sort of just sort of framed it around this kind of controversy he's having with the Rockets over whether or not uh, his demands are acceptable. His ideas about this obviously are very sweeping. Now, you say, like, well, you know, what does he want? Well, he seems to uh, be work from the position that... Uh, Every athlete should be able to have 
their own doctor, who he kind of classifies as more objective because they have no interest in whether or not they can perform athletically. That every athlete should be able to have their own doctor uh, sort of say to the team, well, this person is able to play or they're not able to play because he believes there's a conflict of interest with the, you know, the Rockets doctor being paid by the Rockets. But of course, if this were to really happen across the board, it would just be, I would just, it would kind of invert everything because he also argues that mental illness is the same as a physical illness. So imagine if this policy existed in the NFL, that every NFL player could have their own doctor decide whether or not somebody was able to practice a play. I, I just, I don't see how this could possibly work. It's it, but what's really interesting is, yes, you're right. There's no way it could possibly work. You couldn't have 53 doctors and, you know, running around on an NFL team. But on the other hand, He's also making a really good point that a lot of times the team doctors don't have the best interest of the players at heart. And, you know, maybe their interest is just getting the guy back on the field. Maybe their judgment isn't great. I mean, you see a lot of players, sometimes they don't even involve the teams when they have surgeries. I know Tom Brady was like that. He blew out his knee. He went, he went kind of rogue. He, he didn't want any part of the team doctors at that point and got his own surgeon and all that stuff. Um, well, you know, he, and he's in a position to do that. You know, he's in a position where if he sort of acts on, on you know, uh, as his own entity and ignores the team, uh, his sort of history backs this up. What would be really interesting is if it wasn't Royce White making this claim, say it was somebody like Dwayne Wade or something, you know, so, somebody where the team would have a vested interest in saying like, well, we want to satisfy this person because uh, he clearly is, is central to our success. But, you know, uh, he's a rookie who hasn't played yet on a team who, if he was on the roster, he's like a point forward who needs the ball. And they already got two guys who are like that. Like, I don't know how valuable he would even be to the Rockets if he was playing with them right now. So it's really hard for him to make this totally extreme argument. It's also, I mean, the thing that I think that the reason people found this story interesting wasn't even so much about his scenario, but this idea that he says that like most people are mentally ill. And the reasons for this are basically capitalism and the rise of the media. And I think that's a very interesting argument to make, although it sort of hurts his case if it's true. If everybody has, is mentally ill, well, then it's just a condition that is part of being alive. So I don't know, you know, it's very complex. Yeah, I mean, that that was one of the things that started my kind of my brain going, like, what are the degrees of mental illness? I thought the part that he said about social media, and which I actually ended up using in my Friday column, um, just that all these people that are tweeting at him these horrible things and he's saying, well, isn't this a form of mental illness? And it's like, I don't know. It, it, it might be. I think that's really weird to tweet at somebody some horrible threat. Yeah, it's okay. just not a normal okay. thing to do. Tell me, is, is this weird? Is it weird to sit, say, in a bar with a bunch of other guys and when you see, say, Royce White or anybody come up on the screen to say, like, I hate that guy. Someone needs to kill that guy. Does that make someone insane to say that? Because I suppose the argument could be made that the real, the only real difference with Twitter is that the mechanism exists. That instead of just being able to have this thought, you can now publish this thought, and amazingly, you can publish it in a way that really is only directed at the person you don't like. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to tweet a sentiment because you think my friends will be interested in this. It's another to say direct it right at Royce White or say right at you. Mm. So that the only people seeing it are you and the handful of your friends who happen to follow both the celebrity and the person who hates them. Then it's almost becoming like some way for them to, I don't know, to, to, show their identity as being against Royce White or against whoever, you know? I don't know if that's a mental illness, though. In as much, I mean, it, I, it seems crazy, but does it seem mentally ill? I don't know. 
Yeah, I would say it's probably just strange. I mean, I thought that the single strangest thing that was in the piece was when Royce White said he only played basketball. What did he say, once a week? Yeah, he shoots once a week, he said. I found that very surprising, too. I thought um, that was the revelation of the piece for me. And, it, and I got to be honest, it explained everything. And I don't know if this guy wants to play basketball because, you know, my daughter plays basketball every day, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like you either love basketball or you don't. And if he doesn't love basketball and he it's not some sort of sanctuary for him and it's not a place where he's, you know, regardless of all this other crap that's going on in his life, he's out there two hours a day and he feels safe there and all that. Obviously, basketball is not even like that for him, at least at this point in his life. And I'm not sure well, why he's in the NBA. But isn't part of that reaction you have kind of built on all the fake stories we're fed constantly about athletes? How, you no, know, I, like, I, I you know, actually don't, saying that, I don't like, think saying so. Saying that basketball is their life and their religion. I mean, who is to say that somebody could not succeed at a pro sport without having sort of an obsession with it? I mean, it seems difficult because it's so competitive and there's so many guys who are close to it. But I mean, like, like okay, one guy he kind of reminded me of when I was talking to him a little bit, uh, like Dwayne Thomas, the guy who played for the Cowboys in the early yeah, 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's a guy who was, uh, uh, you know, one of the best running backs in the league. I think at one point Jim Brown said he's the best running back in the league. And I would say his interest in playing football is pretty low. You know, I mean, it's so so the fact that he doesn't practice, every, he's not playing all the time. I do think that that it, it, it suggests one of, I guess, many things. It suggests that maybe his interest in basketball isn't that great. It also could suggest that he's just sort of maybe, you know, not maybe he's a little lazy. I don't know. Uh, it could also suggest that this is a product of having this real mental illness, which nobody seems to dispute. You know, right. but I, I don't. I don't see anyone arguing that they don't think that he has a mental illness problem. So if we start from that, if we assume that that this that this is a real condition, well, it's probably going to manifest itself in weird ways, right? Yeah, I would say you're probably right. Except this is, I think he's like 21 years old. This is his craft. He hasn't achieved anything yet. This is the one thing he's always been really good at. The one constant in his life. To only play once a week to me. I don't even know if you can chalk that up to mental illness. I, I mean, to me, it just seems either lazy or he is just turned on basketball and has just decided he doesn't like it or he's in a phase that he doesn't like it. But um, I can't – you're not going to be good at anything if you do it once a week. I mean, you could That's be good – you could play golf once a week and maybe have a 15 handicap or something, but – Ultimately, anything you do in life, you have to do more than once a week. And for, for him not to understand that or or embrace it, to me, that's that's not. I, I don't think you can chalk that up to mental illness. That's something different. Um, what do you think is going to happen with him? I, you know, I feel like Morley would like Daryl Morley would have given you some insight into this. I'm sure you've talked about it with. Him. I have talked about it with him, and a couple of things about this. First of all. It was not a risky pick, and you pointed that out in your piece. Like they took him, I think, sixteenth. Yeah. And it was a top-heavy draft. Um, if you just look at the guys that went next, I mean, Nicholson that Orlando took, I think, is is going to be um, at least a solid bench player. Um, I think Sollinger, even though he's out for the year now with back surgery, I still think that was the right pick. But you just, no, I, I think it was a great pick. It I just mean, was a bad you, draft. You're, you're picking a guy at sixteen who is potentially the fifth or fourth best player, yeah. and, uh, but might be a washout entirely, I think it's the move to make. Well, Daryl said like yeah. the percentages at that point, you have a one in five chance of getting uh -huh. lucky with that with a player at that in that spot. But then on top of that, it was a top-heavy draft. So I would say it was at that point, it's probably like just considering who the rest of the players were, it was probably like one in eight, one in nine. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, he had top four talent. So at that point, you you roll the dice. And, and this is why I wanted the Celtics to take him with one of those two picks because um, even the one in eight chance that you're getting somebody who's an all-star, you got to take it at 16. I think if he'd gone eighth or something, that's a totally different thing. And also, like, Austin Rivers was the worst pick in that draft. Like, you, you just watch. He's having one of the worst offensive seasons ever in the history of the league and doesn't look like he can play. 
And he went 10th and just even the guys that got taken after him, that's a terrible pick. But, um, yeah, I don't know how this plays out. And, you know, I, the one thing, the takeaway for me, other than everything you had in your piece that you didn't really go into, Twitter is really not a great idea for some people. And I don't think it's a good idea for Royce. I think that, you know, freedom of speech, yes. Um, you, everybody should have a forum, yes. I agree with all that stuff. Twitter, it's really, you can get in trouble really, really easily. And you have people who write for a living who get in trouble. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure when you, when you're talking about a medium where that just captures your thoughts in real time, I'm not sure that's great for him. And I think over anything else, Twitter is going to scare people, scare the NBA teams off of him because he's just too much of a loose cannon. It's one thing to say that stuff to reporters, but when you can just tweet it whenever you want, you just never know. You never know when the next blow up's going to be. And I think that's why he's going to end up getting ostracized in the league. I don't, I just don't think anybody's going to want to deal with him. Well, yeah, you know, he has also very strong views about marijuana use, very strong use about uh, ideas about gambling. Like, I don't know how well he's going to fit into a lot of NBA locker rooms. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't see, uh, not, not that that would stop the guy from having a career, but, you know, he, he for just from talking to him, just, you know, I, and I don't want to act as if I have some super insight into this person. I was with him for 90 minutes or whatever. Um, but he, he definitely does not seem like, a typical pro basketball player, I would think this is going, you know, and that's one thing when he's at Iowa State and he's the best player on the team. But when you're in a pro situation and you're the, you know, the eighth best guy on the team or the fourth best guy on the team, you got to sublimate your personality a little bit and sort of mesh with these people. That could be very difficult for him. It's a great point. And, you know, I genuinely like him. He, we did uh, that short film John Hawk did for mm-hmm. the Grantland Channel, like uh, you know, last summer, which was one of the first things we launched the channel with. And you watch that, and you're just rooting for the guy. Um, I wonder though, he was he was pretty under the radar when he was in college. Like if you look back, like the most success he's had was at Iowa State with Fred Hoiberg that last yeah, year for one year. Yeah, he's, really, you know, he's good. really only had one year of playing at a high level in co- at college, and he had essentially two years of playing at a high level in high school. Right, and that one right. year in college really is October to March, so it's half a year. So he had half a year where he was able to just put everything together, didn't mind the travel that much. He he kept he just socially kept it together, didn't really say anything crazy or anything that didn't go off the handle in any way. And I, and then he got a lot of attention heading into that draft. People were writing about him. People were talking about him. His his mental illness went to the forefront. John Hawk did the piece about him. Um, the pick got a lot of attention for where he went. And I do wonder if the, all that stuff affected him. You know? I, I think it was detrimental. I, I think yeah. to some degree, I think that, uh, even though it was really good, I think that that thirty for thirty short was detrimental to him. It might have been. I feel. I actually really, feel bad about it now. You know that was that was the you know he comes across so well on that, much better than in any other interview situation that I have seen. Mm. Okay, and I think people were extremely sympathetic to it, um, uh, because it would be hard not to. It would be hard not to watch that and sort of. And sort of feel as though like, well, this is somebody trying to sort of overcome something. But when I talked to him, it was less him trying to overcome something and more him trying to force other people to confront something. Yeah, it was like to a sort defiance. Of confront, to confront this idea that mental illness is a completely underrated crisis in America. And... His role in this is really important because he sort of views himself as uh, the first person putting himself in this position where he is, in theory, jeopardizing his career over this one issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it also just might be, you know, it's, it, it's I think that there's a, a degree of fear he has because. You know, of course, he's trying something that's going to be really difficult. He played in the summer league, and he was fine. You know, or at least if he wasn't fine, there were no symptoms or nothing about it that made it seem like he was struggling. Then he shows up to training camp, 
I suppose for the first time in his life, he's consistently playing against guys who are better than him. Maybe then that kind of that anxiety clicks in. Then there's this, you know, there's the pre-existing condition, and then the secondary thing of this sudden realization, like, what if I can't do this? You right. know, and I think that all of these sort of build up in a way, and and this reaction he's having, sort of the stance he's taking, is partially political, and maybe also partially a, a, like an internalized reaction to his discomfort. But here again, I only talked to this guy in any minute, so I don't want to make it seem like I'm a psychiatrist. Right. And John Hawk spent a lot of time with him. I love John Hawk. He's, I think he's one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. He, lo- he loved the guy. He thought, you know, he genuinely thought he was going to make it. And I, I do wonder if there was a lot of, if there was residual damage from, um, not just all the stuff leading up to the draft, but as you said, he goes into training camp for the first time. He, maybe he's getting his butt kicked a little bit. And that was like the final straw that pushed him over, you know, that pushed him to where he is now. I, I hope he makes it. I would love to see. I just liked, you know, I got to say, I didn't really see him in college. I just was watching the YouTube clips. He's so he's such a unique basketball player, and he I also is. feel like I also feel like uh, I like having somebody in the league who brings this stuff up. And oh, absolutely! I mean, it's just I, I it, it's not um, you know even though I, I he probably, the insights he has are at times I think not as profound or because sometimes it's kind of contradictory. Yeah. One thing that he likes to talk about is how like. Um, there's truth in the world and that even if no one knows what that truth is, it still exists. So like in other words, like, you know, is there a God? Well, maybe no one knows, but he goes, there is an answer to that question. To all questions, there is a truth. But then he'll also sort of argue that what's true to him constitutes reality. So how does he know that what he perceives to be truth is this ultimate real thing? You know, it's, that's the kind of stuff where it's like, Maybe it sounds like an argument, but it's not really an argument at all. Yeah. And I mean, there's a history of the, of these rogue kind of guys in the NBA. All of them have, have made the league more interesting. Like I think before uh, Royce, I think Gilbert Arenas was somebody, you know, and 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 unfortunately he's going to get remembered for the locker room thing, Um, which, which, which he deserves to some degree, but he was such an interesting guy those those years and and the way he um he was really the first athlete who embraced the internet as an asset you know and and created this personality that you never knew how much of it was actually him and and how much of it was contrived and um you See, know gave himself a nickname kind of thought, all that I stuff thought, I thought Gilbert Arenas what happened with him was a little bit like what happened to Tupac Shakur who was this kid who was sort of raised in an art school, had a really good sort of upbringing, was uh, like smarter than a lot of his peers, and then got into a, 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 an idiom of art that sort of prompted him to sort of fabricate a, a persona, but then eventually he actually became that person and got killed. Mm. I think with Gilbert Arenas, it was a situation where initially some of the, the curious things he did were just, or, or actually just like kind of funny, like he was just being natural. He just thought it was fun to say these weird things or like take a shower at halftime with his uniform on. But then that got perceived as being really radical and really crazy. And that made, yeah, he was somehow operating outside of the rules of society. And then yeah. he actually did start operating outside of the rules of society. And it kind of wrecked his career. Yeah, it's it's I agree 100%. And I, I think he was the first guy who really understood the power of the blogosphere, which was coming into its own, right, as he was becoming a, a star in the Wizards and and just how he could kind of push his brand in these little subtle ways and things he could do that would make bloggers and, and uh, writers and even some of the TV people kind of just go nuts. Oh, I can't believe he did that. I can't remember anybody kind of pushing the envelope with that stuff. I guess but, you I mean, could say Rodman what's, what's did. What's the but... real lesson of that, though? The real lesson of that is that sports, though, ultimately is, like, objectively measured. So it doesn't matter if people are interested in your brand. It doesn't matter how much of the groundswell of the Internet is behind you. You still have to play well for it to matter. I remember when everybody on the Internet was really interested in the Blazers a couple of years. 
Like, it was, yeah, like, yeah. That was just the theme to write about was like the Rip City stuff. Well, what's the real effect of that? Well, it raised the profile of a team who ended up performing exactly as they would have otherwise. Well, but I, I would argue the the effect would be if you're if you're spending more energy concentrating on what you want people to perceive you to be versus just playing that evidence would say that eventually it's going to not turn out that great for you. I think Dennis Rodman's another example. He, yeah. you know, his first year with the Bulls in 96, and this was after he had, you know, from like 92 to 96, he started to really act strange. And he w- he was one of the first one to get crazy tattoos and, 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 uh, you know, color his hair differently and just was crying for attention at all times. And he was on his way out of the league, goes to the Bulls, puts it all together for one last great season as part of this team that was really like a rock band. It wasn't even an NBA team. It was like this traveling, you know, rock Although, band. Although he, he wasn't, prime. when he got traded from San Antonio, he was actually playing pretty well with them. Oh, yeah. They, made, they almost made. With Popovich. I mean, he, during the, his play from his midpoint with the Pistons through the Bulls was consistent's a weird word to use for him, but it kind of was. I mean, he was always rebounding and he was always defending. He was, no, he was, I, I had him in my top 70. I mean, the problem at San Antonio was he totally undermined David Robinson in the 95 playoffs. And, um, remember he took his shoes off in the third mm. time out and did, and at that point he became toxic. Like the Bulls traded Will Purdue for him, you know, who was a backup center. And that, that's what his trade value was at that point. But, um, he put it together for that one Bulls year, and then he became so enchanted with. I also think he had a drinking problem, and I, I mean, clearly he was doing. He, he was out every night till six, seven in the morning, and he was hooking up with everybody, and and he became the celebrity became part of part of the appeal to him, and all of a sudden he's out of the league. They won the title in '98. Um, he never really had another meaningful NBA moment. You know, well, and he part went of from, that had to do with he was somebody who succeeded with virtually no refined skill. It was all physical. Right. You know, he he he, he wasn't a, a a good shooter or a good ball handler or even that natural of a passer. He wasn't terrible, but it was mainly that he could just he just went after the ball differently, and he he just used his body differently. And I think he had like a real natural strength. Um, Incredible so defender that, too. Yeah. He was, so, he was the, uh, so this is something I, I want to Wait, well, hold on, hold on. I got one more, okay. one more thing okay. before we move on. The, the race weight, he reminds me of, uh, Bison Dele. Hmm. I think he's That's in that, in that same phylum. But, and Bison Dele, who was originally Brian Williams, was somebody that was always questioning the, whatever everybody thought was the case. You know what I mean? And was super smart, was somebody that I don't think loved playing basketball, but had a lot of natural talent and was just a wild card. And, uh, you know, I think Royce has Royce has been diagnosed with real issues. I, I wonder, like, looking back, did Brian Williams, was was he a little bit like that? What was going on with him? Because he was the single quirkiest guy of of that whole era. And, you know, I, I if we were making like if you're putting all these guys in you called it like an all-star team of sorts of just guys who just lived outside the NBA norm. I think uh, Royce, Bison Dele, Dennis Rodman, Arenas, and oh, maybe a couple Cass, other. Certainly. I mean, it's like the thing is that, that statistics suggest that 26% of adults have some kind of mental, like diagnosable mental illness problem in a given year. So a fourth of the country. So the question then becomes, would this, figure translate to the NBA and essentially saying the NBA has one, like one fourth of the players in the NBA have mental illness or does mental illness cause these guys to weed themselves out to stop them from getting as far as Royce White has. Mm. I have to say my natural inclination is to say the former because certainly from covering, like I've covered, you know, music and, and like film and stuff more than I've covered sports. And in that world, it's very clear that because you have something to offer that is special and unique, people will sort of perpetuate and allow you to be a little crazy, you know, or, or to have these problems and they kind of work around it. And I would think the same, you know, it would probably happen even more often in sports. You know, 
all these guys in the NFL who end up getting out of the league, you know, and they beat up their wife or have these domestic abuse issues, we always sort of think that that is somehow connected to football, that the experience of football, because it's like this gladiatorial situation, they can't get out of this mindset of, of you know, of, of violence. But it might be because they were always the kind of person predisposed to violence. It's just that during the period where they were at their athletic prime, somebody was able to sort of direct that into playing outside linebacker or something. You know, well, that they were always mentally ill. Wouldn't you say, though, that if you reach a certain level of fame or like success right away, we've talked about this before on the podcast a little bit, just the effects that when people start acting differently around you so, and all of a sudden you're taking heat from some people and then other people, um, it's just nonstop adulation. You can have sex with anybody you want. Like, Think how many musicians go off the deep end after their first successful album. Like, I wouldn't say those are people that were mentally ill. I think those are people that had trouble handling things that they never expected would happen to them. Or am I overthinking See, I don't know, because very often when I think about those kinds of guys, or those kinds of people, I guess it could be women as well, I think to myself, had they not succeeded at music, or they had not succeeded as an actor, you know, would they have been able to succeed as an insurance salesman or as somebody who like runs, you know, a, a realtor office or something? Most of the time, I would say no. I mean, there, I, I, I don't. A lot of times, the guy, um, you know, the, the kind of person who has these super long career, like Madonna or John Bon Jovi. Yes, it's easy to see those people succeeding in other avenues, but people who are artistic temperaments. Or I guess in what we're talking about, almost like athletic temperaments, if that counts. Yeah. I don't know if uh, if their if, it, if it's a success as much as just the way they naturally are. Like they just may be naturally self-destructive people, and that sort of feeds their art. Like, what do you think the difference was between why Allen Iverson flamed out so fast and why Kobe Bryant in year seventeen is still as hyper focused as he ever was? Did Allen Iverson flame out fast, though? He had a long career. He had a Hall of Fame career. Uh, Allen Iverson flamed out. I think at the end, I mean, he just... He played uh, 30... He, I think he had 13 years. But mm -hmm. he's coming from a generation where pretty much everybody from his era was able to play 16, 17 years. And also, like, he was a guard. It, it's it a real beating, fast. though. He was the most physical beating. point guard of that era by far. And also was, at, you know, was the all-time partier of that generation. Yeah. And I think that, you know, all those 7 a.m. nights start to add up. But Well, you know, it's, you know I, went to the, I went to the Lakers-Nets game last night. And, oh, you, and, you went? Know, and, yeah, uh, my wife won raffle tickets, won these tickets in a raffle. So uh, we had these really good seats, you know. It kind of, you know, so it was fun to watch. It was fun to be close, kind of. And uh, you know, I, was, I spent a lot of time watching Kobe, and it is very interesting how, uh, certainly for the first three quarters of these games, now he really is the more of a passer than anything else. I mean, he's just he he's, he distributes the ball more than Nash does in terms of moving it around from side to side. Now that's something that Allen Iverson was never going to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, so so once his skills start to erode and he's not, I mean, I, I, I wonder if this is going to be the same situation with Carmelo Anthony, actually, that when you get into a situation where these guys are not the best player on your team, they're only even the third best player on your team, they start to hurt you because they can really only succeed in the position of being the center. It's, you know, like um, I, and, and with, I like, Iverson was not going to be the kind of person who'd be like, I want to become this new, like, hyper version of Vinnie Johnson. Or I'm going to come off the bench for people on their, in their second unit, and I'm going to score 14 points in 11 minutes, and I'm going to change the second quarter. He'd never do that. Now, if he would have wanted to do that, would he, would he be flamed out? I don't think so. I, I think, think if that had been his mentality, I think he would still maybe be in the league now. He could have been an awesome six man off the bench. Like a Jamal Crawford type. I think I think he should have had an extra even when I wrote my book and I was trying to rank him, not knowing how his career was gonna end, I I had him like ten spots higher than he he should have been because 
I was assuming he was going to have this whole second act as a six man or whatever. I just figured he'd be able to do that until he was 37. And I think it's funny. You look at the way some of these careers end, like another guy, Gary Payton, could never reinvent himself as a role player. And his career never really had that extra three, four, five years that, you know, look at Jason Kidd. He's last four years totally reinvented himself. Almost, I said on TV, he's like a character actor now. It's like he's like Tommy Jones and Lincoln. He comes in for two scenes, and and you're like, oh, I love Tommy Lee Jones, and then he leaves. And that's kind of what Jason Kidd is now. But this was a guy who ten years ago was, you know, the the best guard in the league. Mm -hmm. And um, reinvention, I think, is interesting. But back to Kobe, I'm really glad you went to that game. I had a lot of questions. Uh, I think that was that was their only Brooklyn game. Yeah, that was their only Brooklyn yeah. game. You had some Laker fans there. You have all like pretty much the entire block, basketball blogosphere lives in Brooklyn, so I'm sure there was just a lot of hardcore basketball fans at that game. Um, it was a great Kobe performance. It was really like you watch that game. He's 17 years into his career at this point. That, that's kind of the way I've always wanted him to play. That's the way I think everybody should play. You get your teammates involved. You make sure everybody's happy. You give up your share of the pie to get everyone else going. And then when the game matters, you take over and you win it. Like that's what guys like Isaiah Thomas and Bird and Magic yeah, Johnson. Well, I mean, I, and, personally, I like when Kobe tried to score 60. That was my favorite version <laughs> of him. But the way he plays now, it really does validate these claims that he makes that all he cares about is like winning and history and his legacy. Because he, hmm. he it's, it, it, I, I don't get any sense that he was pushed toward this by D'Antoni. I don't think D'Antoni really can push him at all. I think he's the decision he made that he's now going to be sort of like, a, uh, this, you know, he rebounds more now. Uh, he's just like sort of a, uh, more of like a, like a really high end blue guy in some ways. Uh, and that was, his, you know, I, I think that it really reflects well on him. It's sort of, uh, you know, my opinion of him has really changed over the last 20 years. I mean, I, I it's, it has really kind of went uh, up and down, but this is maybe the highest it's been. It, my counter to that would be he's never totally committed to playing like this. Like even when they won in 09 and 2010, it was always clear that he was going to – he a slightly modified version of the way he's always played. But – in the end, that it was team still was gonna... better. This team is bad. They are not that good. Like he has to do this for them to make the playoffs. He has to do this. But here's the thing: like the... Se seven years ago, when he was in a similar spot, he decided the way for him to do this was to shoot thirty times a game. So it's like he's That's... realized. He, maybe he realized from his other experiences, uh, "We we aren't going to win if I do that. Maybe I'll go the other way." I think he puts more thought into how he plays than just about anybody ever. I really think he he puts serious, 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 all day, all night thought into what not only how do we win, but what's the best situation for me. And this was one of the rare times that he thought, I just want to win. And I, I guess I guess I'm gonna have to try this because if I don't do this, then we're gonna finish with twenty five wins. Well, yeah, you know, seven years ago, he did act differently. But, man, seven years is a long time. Think of how the decisions you made in your life. Yeah, how yeah. How different, you know, we would have made them seven years ago. And and also, you know, he, he, you know, Kobe feels old to me. He feels like he's way older than I am, but he's younger than me. You know, he's like, he's at, what, 36? He is. I think he's 35 still. I don't think he's 30, 36 yeah. yet. You know, yeah. It, like an old guy like I when I watch him I feel like you know I still feel the way I mean that's always just a weird phenomenon in general that athletes always seem older than me well what's and funny it's weird is that none of them are he's you know? the same age as Tom Brady which seems weird yeah it's just it's weird who, it's who just should weird seem feeling. older out of those two uh, what who should seem older between Tom Brady and Kobe <sighs> Kobe's been a high profile person longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since basically high school, so ninety five. Yes. Whereas yeah. Brady, like really, other than a, a cup of coffee with Michigan, nobody had even given him a thought until uh, mm. October two thousand one. So did you feel like I don't know how many times you've seen Kobe in person, but did you feel like it was a special experience? 
Well, the first time I saw him in person was the game against the Knicks in Madison Square Garden when he had like 64, 68. Oh wow! Yeah, that was the, that. So that was the best. That was the best to said. You know, so that was a much more special feeling experience than this. This game was actually it was kind of poorly played for the most part. Um, uh, it was uh, I, I was uh, like Brooke Lopez played really well, kind of quietly at a he's good a mobster. Brooke Lopez yeah, is. is a good player. He is. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I Nash seems to be. Uh, Certainly compromised. He's just not. I mean, he's he's still good, but he's just not the guy he used to be. And no. the drop off was relatively significant in a short amount of time. Uh, Gasol got hurt. Uh, Howard didn't play. Uh, the Nash thing's a bummer. And I, I well, don't know he's whether a, he's you know, he's an old person. He's he feels old. <laughs> right, and it's it's going to happen. You know, one of these yeah. years, it's it's was bound to happen. I the only thing for me, I don't know if he's a hundred percent. And he had that leg injury, and I just don't know if he's the same. But there's a chance that he's going to have to go through that reinvention process, which we were just mm-hmm. talking about. And well, I mean, you know, he brings the ball up, but I mean, obviously, you've seen more Laker games than I have. He's sort of in the set offense. He's sort of playing two now. He's like your yeah. two guard. And the one thing that hasn't disappeared is his ability to shoot. Right. He still shoots, you know. So, so this seems to be like a, a good move for the team. Like the idea of Kobe being the guy who's sort of like. The kind of you know, kind of a point forward ish type of point guard. Nash kind of just looking for shots and this offense and I, I don't know, they, they I'll be interested to see how they finish. I mean maybe they, they may I, I would not be shocked if they ended up finishing the year strong and making the playoffs and being someone no one wants to play but then losing early. Nash reinventing himself as mid nineties Steve Kerr. Which he always knew was gonna happen, but uh I, I didn't expect it to happen this year. I thought he had one more like really elite year, but I guess we'll see. But last thing on Brooklyn, um, how do you feel like that's having an NBA team there and, and the new arena, the new logo, the T-shirts, the hats? How is that? You've been in Brooklyn a long time. How has that affected um, your experience as a Brooklyn uh, – Brooklyn, what, is, what is it called? Brooklyn resident. Resident. Uh, well, I like it being here. I, re- I think they did a really good job picking their color scheme. The logo looks really good. Uh, I The venue, is I can walk to it from my apartment, so that's great. Has it really changed the culture of Brooklyn? I would say not really. I mean, the thing about the New York area, or one of the many things about it is, you know, if uh, when a team comes into a place like Oklahoma City or to Sacramento or whatever, like, that team can struggle for two years, and it's still exciting. It's just exciting that they have this thing that sort of validates them as a major city. But, of course, do we feel that way here? So the expectation, basically, is we'll be interested in the Nets uh, if uh, if they're better than the Knicks. You know, right? So, I mean, right now there's more interest in the Knicks purely because of success. I mean, they just it's, it's such a success-driven sports community here. Uh, I mean, that's the only thing that matters. So let's say... Um, Brooke Lopez gets hurt. Darren Williams goes in the tank. Next year, they're a 30 win team. What happens? Nobody goes. Like, 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 like the the, the Barclay Center is half empty. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. My, I mean, I don't, that's what that's what my prediction would be. I mean, the, I mean, these tickets are really expensive. I mean, I I I was at this, I guess, the club level seating where yeah. you can like walk up into a little area where they have like a smorgasbord and stuff. So it was cool to get to win these tickets, but I think their face value was like 495 bucks or 395 oh bucks. It was not, uh, it was not $400 of entertainment. You know? Yeah. They, uh, the, and they'll probably jack, they'll probably try to keep those prices for year two. And, I'm going to be very interested to see a lot of people, I think, jumped on the bandwagon this year, like the the rich people who might get the best seats. I'll be interested to see if they renew those seats. And that and that's makes me think, like, that if there's a team that's ready to do some sort of a panic trade before this trade deadline, that's the team to me. Because well, they, put a, they put a competitive team on the floor, though. It's competitive. Like, I don't know how they, interesting they have, it is. They have six guys, and they can play with anybody, you know, in the regular season, I feel like. And I feel that was sort of the, that was probably the underlying sort of idea going into this. Like, hey, we don't need, like, it'd be great to get Dwight Howard. That'd be really exciting. The main thing we need to do is make sure that after the All-Star break, we're over 500. 
So people are like, this still matters. You yeah. Know? Let's talk about PEDs. I wrote about it on, uh, yes, on Friday. I, want, I, have, I have several things I wanted to ask you about this. I, you know, I, I emailed you after that column. I thought it was you know, very interesting and great column. Um, first of all, um, here's my first question. You begin by talking about how there's like the sports fan you and the ESPN you, and that mm. there was this, you know, I, 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 it was, I thought it was kind of a cool thing for you to bring up and to a degree recognize. I'm wondering wh- when you, when did that happen? When did you start feeling that you were split into two kinds of people? Well, I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm split into two types of people, but I would say, you know, as your career goes along, you get older. You start, you know, you have more people reading you, which makes you maybe less likely to take chances sometimes. Every, if you, if you write something that, um, is, uh, you know, controversial or whatever, it's going to be more controversial because more people are going to see it. Oh, I know. I, and, I, I, everybody understands why this happened. I'm wondering when you recognize it. Like, when did you start feeling this, or did you really only recognize it right now before you wrote this column? Oh no, it's it's it happens with the, anybody's career as you, as you get older and more people are reading you or whatever. I think the thing for me is, um, what I what I didn't understand was something I've been thinking about since the Olympics, basically, and all the conversations I was having at the Olympics with people about, do you think this guy's cheating? Do you think that guy's cheating? And it just wasn't being reflected in what, you know, say ESPN was talking about for very valid reasons. You know, you don't want conversations like that in the wrong hand. You're worried about due process. There's a million reasons why we shouldn't talk about this stuff publicly. But at the same time, there was such a disconnect between all the convers. you know, obviously for what I do for a living, I'm going to run into people all the time in sports. Um, who know stuff, you know, executives, athletes, things like that. And this PEDs thing, it, it to me just wasn't being discussed enough. And I didn't really understand it. And so I had been thinking about it. I'd been thinking about it. I'd been thinking about it. And I, I didn't know when I was going to write it. I actually almost wrote it after the Marquez Pacquiao fight because I was really upset about that. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember the reasons why I didn't write about it. I think I, I had another calm do or there's vacation coming or something weird, but I ended up not doing it then. And then I had, I started, was getting these, when Peterson was on his streak, was just getting these emails about him. And I don't think he's cheating, but enough people were emailing about it that I was started thinking like, have I, have I been compromised? Like, am I just like, because I work for, ESPN and we want all these people to be clean. Like, am I just, did I lose my objectivity here? And that's kind of what eventually led to writing the call. Well, you know, it's a complicated deal though, because it, one, one thing that I, in the call that I guess I mildly disagreed with was when you were saying how, okay, why is it problematic to speculate about this? You know, we speculate on whether Peterson is going to break Eric Turchison's record. Why is it somehow different to speculate uh, no, I, I said that. I said that that was in the fake talking head exchange. Well, so it was, I, a, it was a little. I, I think that that's before the fake talking head exchange, because I mean, mm. obviously, there is a pretty significant difference between speculating on one of those things and the other. Well, I guess the the thing that, and maybe this will never happen, but here's the fundamental problem for me, and the reason why I wrote the column. The drug testing is so bad in in this country with with our professional sports, and nobody cares. Who's none of the players care? The leagues don't care, and they don't care about the effect that it has on the fans. And I felt like, for me personally, um, you know, I I was hoping people would read the column and start talking about this because. I feel like we've reached some sort of a tipping point and I, a tipping point is a word that's used too much. But in this case, I really feel like we're at that point where the players have to start caring about this. I need players to step forward and, and take some accountability. I want some quarterback who's not cheating or some running back or whatever to be the guy who, who, you know, pushes for real change the way Kurt Flood did or somebody like that. Yeah, once okay. Upon well, tell, a time. Me, tell me this though. Okay. Cause you yeah. said you need this to happen. And I, and here's what I, I, I you sort of touch on this in the column, but not really. Okay. Mm. So what is for you, 
What's the principal thing that bothers you about PADs? Is, PADs, is it that uh, it's it's making the game different than you imagine? Is it because it's putting these guys, these athletes, in jeopardy? Or is it just the idea that it's cheating? That just it, that the rules say you can't, and they're doing it, and that's the problem. Like, what, what, Why does this bother you as much as it does? It bothers me for a variety of reasons. Um, I don't think anybody has made a real effort to figure out. I, I wrote this in the column. What is what is cheating and what isn't? Because if you look at the, if you made a list of like, here's stuff you can take and here's stuff you can't, it would make no sense. It would be totally illogical. Um, so just indiscriminately, we've decided what's good and what's not good. Um, yes. That's one thing that bothers me. I feel bad for some of the players that that don't cheat. And, you know, you, you're talking about, um, let's say, I'm not saying he's cheating, Colin Kaepernick. Um, obviously, you know, young athlete would be very, I would say it's extremely unlikely and almost impossible that he's, he doesn't, I wouldn't see why he would need PEDs at this point in his career. But let's say he, let's say Colin Kaepernick was a 33 year old player who started using PEDs and Alex Smith got a concussion. Kaepernick came in. He took his job. So now Alex Smith gets waived. He doesn't have a totally guaranteed contract. Alex Smith goes from he's a quarterback on the Niners making $8 million a year to he loses his job because 33-year-old, you know, let's say he's a Ken Kim in Eddie type, but it's it's the quarterback, 10 years older Kaepernick. Kaepernick took his job. Is that fair? I feel like that's so unfair, and I'm sure this is happening left and right in sports, and we just don't know. So um, your issue, your your pro, your biggest issue with these? No, that's not my biggest issue. It's just oh, one issue. Okay. Um, I I don't like the fact that I don't know who's cheating and who isn't. I don't like the fact that I'm talking about this with my friends all the time. I don't feel like this is like a really fun part of following sports. Um, but the thing that really bothers me more than anything is that we have the technology to at least try and figure this out. And you know, a lot of people didn't know about the NBA. And the fact that they only do four drug tests a year and the fact that in on March 10th, you could take your four drug test. And from that point on, you can literally put whatever you want in your body. See, I have and, a question about I have a question. Yes. about That's the pretty part of your column. OK. okay. Your column says that players in the NBA can be can be uh, randomly tested four times throughout the season. And after the yes. fourth test, there's no more testing. So no in more theory, testing. if you, you know, OK, how many players are tested four times in a year? Because I was wondering if this, if typically NBA guys are tested twice a year or once a year, but because there's the potential for two or three or four tests that could happen at any time, that's why you make the number before. It's a good you point. Make the number four, because I, cause the thing is, I don't, I have a hard time imagining that LeBron was tested, is going to be tested four times for PDs this year. I mean, I just, I, I think that one, I just think it's, it would be odd unless they were testing way more than I realized, testing everybody. There also would be sort of a vested interest in not over testing him, you know? It would obviously hurt the league if someone like that. Or you could flip it around and you, you test him the four times so, you know, you don't have to test him again. I just, I know for a fact. Is that happening? I would be pretty shocked. I mean, we can probably find this out, I guess, but I, like, I wonder, you know, how many times was Rudy Gay tested for uh, PEDs last year? Well, here's why I know I about this. Here's the whole reason I know this whole thing. I know somebody who's friends with an NBA player who had the fourth test, and it was like game 71, and was all fired up. I went out that night and smoked pot with whoever the girl he was hooking up with and was joking about it the next day. So, so, it, so it does happen. There are guys who are being tested four times in a year. Yes. You know at least of one. Or I know at least you don't of one. know of one, but you have anecdotal, anecdotally heard of one. Yeah. Anecdotally heard of then this guy saying, oh, this is blah, blah, blah. And, and then I did a little more digging and found out this is like a relatively infamous thing, the fourth test. So listen, whatever. Um, the, the bigger point is that, well, actually, there's a couple of big points with this. You could make the case that the NBA would have the most to lose from a PED scandal out of all the leagues, right? Because they their league hinges on the success of like 12 to 13 guys. And, yes. 
And if it, the was, interest, if it was one of them, yes, that would be that would be that'd the be interest in the league. If even if you look at the TV ratings, ebbs and flows depending on the fame and superiority level of the of this list of whether it's twelve or fifteen or whatever. And I don't know if the, I. First of all, the NBA has not made it a priority. I also think the players' union hasn't made a priority at all, and it almost seems like the biggest thing for them, not only to protect the players' right to cheat, but also to protect their right to smoke pot, which is like a massive thing for them. It's like, you know, the marijuana testing, and they want to make sure. Um, it, I guess, like, my takeaway with the NBA would be in the 80s, they were so concerned about cocaine, remember? Like, Stern made uh, this, like, a uh. huge priority. This is killing our league. We've got to get rid of it. They went totally overboard with these first, second, third strike things. Guys are now getting kicked out of the league because Stern's like, I'm not going to allow this anymore. I'm not allowing this on my watch. So why doesn't he care about PEDs? Makes no sense. Why doesn't he have the same passion that he did 30 years ago to stop cocaine use? Now you could well, say, I mean, I suppose there's one, there's kind of one obvious answer, but it doesn't because, really reflect well on Stern. What's the Which answer? Is that PD use actually improves the level of play. Right. Well, and then the other yeah. thing would be cocaine causes death, and people were going to games, and these guys were zonked out, and he and the whole reputation of the league was that it was a, yeah. it was a league that was on cocaine. Yeah. And for whatever reason, during the whole PD era, the NBA has skated free on PDs because this weird false narrative has come out. That oh no, it doesn't help those guys. Really? Well, doesn't help those of, guys. It's part of what's tough about this is that I always think that performance enhancing drugs are a little bit like uh, like radar guns and radar detectors. It feels like that whoever is uh, trying to beat the system is always ahead. Right. So like you know, how did Lance Armstrong pass all of these tests? He was the most tested athlete in the history of that sport. I think it was because he was just on the cutting edge of performance enhancement. And that's and his legacy. Like, he was the, the greatest, greatest cheater. Yes. He's yes, the, the greatest Lance cheater. Lance Armstrong's the greatest cheater ever. Cheat. Yeah. Okay, so like, like the thing about Ray Lewis, okay, so Ray Lewis uh, is, is in theory using antler spray, okay? Well, um, that's one come. of many, that could have been one of many yes, things okay. he used. Okay, here's the deal. Antler spray, like, I don't, I'm no expert on antler spray, but I know that antlers are like the fastest growing bones in nature. Uh, they, they, they seem to have a, a, they're locked in to something called, I read like, a, a secondary masculine traits. So they maybe they're, you know, there's a lot of things, I guess, I can see how somehow antler spray could help an injury heal. So if it's a part of the healing pro, I mean, you know, like, in some ways, this seems obvious, but I want to—I want you to explain this to me. Why is, say, amoxicillin, which is which is going to help someone heal from a bacterial infection faster, why is that totally okay? And why is cortisone pretty much okay, but something like deer antler spray would not be? It's funny because I was hoping you would explain this because this is the best case for PEDs, and this is why. I wish we had like a real plan with this because let's look at Peterson, for instance. It was fun to have him back when he came back. Like we grew up with people lamenting Gail Sayers. Oh man, it's mm -hmm. I wish yeah. Gail Sayers didn't leave after two years. And if we had the technology we had now, Gail Sayers would have kept playing. Even somebody like Terrell Davis on Denver who blew out his knee, never the same. I think the technology we have now, maybe he comes back. He probably um, makes the Hall of Fame. He probably has one right. more year of 1,200 yards, and that's enough. So if you're looking at it romantically, like, all right, we have drugs now that can help heal the, help these guys not only heal from injuries that they couldn't heal from before, but help them heal faster and get back to where they were within less than a year. I don't. I I personally don't think that's a terrible thing. Um, I don't either. And. I, this is part of the struggle with PEDs. I think when base, when what happened, whatever happened in baseball from '97 to 2003 was ridiculous. Like, let's all agree that can never happen again. But if you told me, if Ray, if if they made it so that, hey, Ray Lewis, he he, yeah, he was getting HGH injected into his torn tricep muscle to help it heal faster, and really there are no no side effects other than 
this, you know, they, there are these small side effects, but really everything has side effects. Um, if I took too many, if I took eight Advil a day, there are side effects, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't think we can pick and choose what, what side effects are okay and which ones aren't. But like, if, if he had done that with his tricep, I don't know how that's much different than what Kobe did with the pla- plasma regurgitation, whatever the, I mean, that knee process that now everybody's getting and Dwight Howard got in his shoulder, I don't understand how that's any different than HGH. Well, I mean, I suppose it has, I mean, it, I, I don't know enough about that German, like, what, what do they do there? They, they take your cells and put them in the centrifuge or something? Yeah, they, they basically take blood and they change it and then they inject it back in your body and it's like strengthening. How is it now? That to me is like blood doping then. It would seem that way, yeah. But yeah. That, like, here's another example: Dave Jacoby, um, who you know well, who who yeah. uh, who is producing this podcast right now. His 93 year old grandmother is staying with him. Guess what she had with her? A giant bottle of HGH that said HGH on the bottle that she's taking. So we give HGH to old people. Um, I don't know. It just seems like there's just no plan at all, and I don't get it. And that, I mean, but, yeah. But this is what, what I thought that the thing that the, the, the driving thing for you, the reason this that you want to see these like athletes step forward and take these tests, is because you feel it is negatively impacting your ability to enjoy the sport. Yes, because I don't know what people are doing. Okay, and, so and, and I don't and, know I don't know what constitutes cheating and what doesn't, and I don't know if I'm watching player A. Uh, Kicking player B's ass and player B's clean and player A's cheating, you know, I, I don't know. I went to the Olympics. Usain Bolt was, that was one of the great things I've ever seen in my life, watching that guy run. Now, if I find out he was cheating five years later, I'm going to be devastated. Um, and I'm just tired of feeling that way, you know, and I, I don't, I, I think people, people fall into one or two camps here where, where they either go, yeah, you're right. We need to fix this. Or they say, ah, just make everything legal. What's the big deal? I had really smart people this weekend say to me, screw it. We should just legalize anything. What's the difference? Who cares? Well, a lot of the people who make that argument are also working from the perspective that in about, I don't know, they give different timetables, but like in five to ten years, there will be things that can be done genetically that will be impossible to test for. Which is probably where we're headed. Yeah, and and once that happens, it's sort of like this argument will almost seem irrelevant. It'll be that one window of time in between, you know, no science in sports, basically, besides nutrition, and all science in sports, where but, that, you know, that will, and this will be just like, we will, we will have lived through this kind of interesting middle period in between those two realities. But Chuck, don't you find it bizarre that, the NFL has placed such an emphasis on player safety and concussion awareness, and they've gone so overboard in a good way, positively, with we have to be more careful, and yet we don't even have blood testing. I mean, why couldn't they have said, hey, whoever makes the Super Bowl, you're getting blood tested the day before the game, and we're spending all this money in this equipment, and if you're cheating, we're going to find out. And whatever's in your body, we're publishing on our website. Would you think? Do you think that's unconstitutional, or would you be for it? Would I think it's unconstitutional? Um, I would not think it's unconstitutional. To a degree, I think it's a little bit unethical. I guess, uh, you know, I mean, I've written about this. I think I feel like we've both written about this. Like, football is in this unique situation where these, like, there's these two parallel lines rocketing skyward. One being the popularity of the league which seems to be dwarfing everything else. I mean, right. it, it really does feel to me now, I know it's technically not true, but just from like a being alive and talking to people about sports a lot, it feels like football, pro and college, is as popular than all the other sports combined. And at the other kind of parallel line is this sense that like football is the most doomed sport you, one can possibly imagine. Yeah, it, Gladwell, it thinks like it's, it's, Gladwell thinks what? it's gone in 30 years. Yeah, well, he, you know, uh, I did a talk with him in Brooklyn one time, and and he, his, at the end of his speech, he was talking about, you know, drafting quarterbacks. He said that in 25 years, no one will be eating red meat, and no one will be playing football. 
And I went up and I basically said, like, there's a better chance that I will be eating football players than that happening. I will never stop eating red meat and I will never stop watching football. I don't know, though, that in a very short amount of time, his argument seems much more plausible than I would have ever imagined. Although, you know, then he talked to somebody like I did a podcast last year with like Kirk Herbstreet. And we brought this up a little bit. And for, as like, for, you know, as a guy living in Tennessee, he's like, that's never going to happen here. It's almost idiotic to bring it up. So I do wonder if we're going to have a future where football is going to be played in the South, in parts of the Midwest, the island of Samoa, maybe certain sectors of California. But it's going to be this thing where it's going to be a total divide between the economic class of who plays and who watches. So like, it'll be like people it'll be will, boxing. Yes. Although maybe even more profound because, uh, you know, I, boxing has kind of disappeared from the public conversation. I feel like SEC football will always be the most important part of sports culture in the South. But there will, but in our lifetime, if you go to – Georgia, or you go to you know Birmingham, Alabama, or whatever. The main thing that will be interested is Southeast Conference football. So I think that it's you know, and it will still be the thing that people want to watch on Saturdays. Boxing was not you know, it wasn't the the violence that killed boxing; it was the corruption. You know, well, no, it was it was two things killed boxing, and it happened in two stages. One was when uh, Ben the Benny Pere thing. Because boxing was on TV all the time nationally, and then it started fading away, and, and was still popular with the big fights. But um, that was phase one, and then phase two was what happened to Ali. I will fight that to the death. I think, <clears throat> I think watching Ali, who was the most charismatic, likable, um, articulate athlete probably of that whole era, watching him basically turn into the into this quivering guy who couldn't even put five sentences together. Um, I think that really affected people. And I don't think people were the same with boxing after that. I know well, I, I, I still I watch the big fights, thing, but I wasn't another, the same. If, if, if we're using Ali as one possibility, I think another real death blow was, I mean, what happens if Tyson kills Buster Douglas and just keeps winning? What if, you mm. know, what if he has a, a like a, uh, a, like a sterling 48 fight career undefeated? Does the interest in heavyweight boxing continue all the way through the night? I mean, oh, it's I assuming see. he doesn't go to prison and stuff. Like, I think heavyweight like, heavyweight boxing comes back the moment there's the next Tyson. That that's the one thing with boxing is if if you had like a, a transcendent star, and I think this goes for any sport because we saw it happen with golf for God's sakes. You take a transcendent star, you put them in the sport, and it's going to be awesome. It just is. It, do you do tennis? Golf? Does that still seem possible to you? Does it yeah. still seem oh, possible yeah. for a Boxing. transcendent heavyweight to exist? I don't know if I can imagine that happening. I mean, well, the, in all likelihood, it, I mean, if we wait long enough, everything happens. But it just seems like I don't know. That sport is so weird now. It's like it just it, yeah. It, it does. It doesn't even seem to have. I mean, I guess like the, the Pacquiao fight and stuff would still be a big deal. I feel like that that there's a certain kind of guy who'll always want to watch that. But yeah. All right, so baseball instituted blood testing for this year. And baseball takes a lot of crap, for, and rightly so, for a lot of stuff that happened and, and the way they turned a blind eye to everything. It's the one sport out of the four that finally said, that's it. We're putting in blood testing. And I don't know how many people they're going to catch, but to me this has been, and I should have put this in the piece, it's going to be one of the most fascinating subplots of this baseball season. You might have guys who are averaging 35, 38 homers a year dropping down to like 15. I don't well, know what's going to happen. I feel like that there's already been a pretty big drop in power numbers, though. Yeah, but this so, now I mean, I we're really going to see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, but let me ask you, though. So David Stern, they already did the collective bargaining agreement, and they can't do anything about blood testing this time around. At least the league can't. But what if... Let's say Kobe Bryant. Let's say he's he's been clean his whole career. And I don't know if he has, to be honest. Maybe he probably has, but I don't know. I don't know with any of these guys. Let's say Kobe says, you know what? I'm, I'm year 17. I've won five titles. I want part of my legacy to be that I help clean up basketball. I think some of the guys I'm playing against are cheating. And I'm going to really start pushing for blood testing. And I'm going to make this like a real thing. And I, and I want to go down in history as 
the guy who pushed this agenda forward. And people will point at me when they say, oh, yeah, that's the guy who cleaned up basketball or helped us clean it up. Why, ha- why has an athlete done that yet? Well, um, that's, uh, you know, uh, a guy in baseball actually did try that. Rick Helling tried that. He used to go to all the. Wasn't famous enough. The, he wasn't what? famous enough. It has to be one of the best well, I guys. I know. I know. It wasn't. He wasn't. Um, the, uh, you know, if somebody like Kobe did, I guess. Well, okay, first of all. Or Tim Duncan. Does, it would have to be somebody with, with yeah. that carried real weight and respect. I I suppose that. You know, Kobe wants his legacy to be as a basketball player first. That might be part of it. He doesn't want to distract from that. Might be because you know he has he knows people who are who are probably cheating. He doesn't. You know, it it would be you know it would be really hard to push for a, a anti drug policy if you knew people and were friends with people who See, you knew were think, on drugs. And you just described why it's not going to happen because. Every one of these guys is playing with people who cheat and they're always going to default toward the sense of team over the sense of league and the sense of sport. I mean, in cycling, it's different. You're basically, you're, you're on your own for the most part. And I think track and field's the same way. Um, but I, I think that's why we'll, we're, we're just not going to see a player step forward and really try to fight this. And, you know, when Schilling tried to do it a little bit in, the mid two thousands, people were mocking him, you know, and they thought he was trying to, he was trying to grandstand for attention. And here's the irony. You, you think about like how PR conscious some of these athletes are, right? Like somebody like LeBron, like they, he does that Samsung galaxy commercial and there's so, there's so much thought put into that, right? It's like this minute long commercial and he's with his buddies and you're just, Everything about that is this contrived ploy to make LeBron seem more likable. Nothing would make LeBron more likable than if he said, I've been clean my whole life. I'm tired of going against guys who aren't, and we have to fix this now. We need blood testing. We're going to have new players association head, and we got to fix this. Let's fix this right now. Um, that's the part that I don't get is it would be such a good thing for one of these guys to do this, and none of them have the balls to do it. So it's just a bummer. Well, they also, I, they may not think the problem is as profound as you do. Well, in fact, I think in generally, I would guess most athletes think of it as less problematic and see it less stigmatized than fans do. Yeah, because I, 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 because it it helps them play better. It enhances helps their them play performance. Better, and I I also just think that like I, I don't know there 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 has to probably be some kind of code or integrity in that world where it's you know. You want, you know, you play hard, you know, and and you're you're not going to get involved with other people's business. I mean, like, how uncool would it be if some guy in the NBA was like, you know what? There's a huge marijuana problem in the league, and I'm very <laughs> Christian. Is. I don't like that. So here's a list of all the players I know smoke pot. Well, that's that's. Now, there's, there are that's some it. people who would say that that is good, but that would not really be very cool. And I wonder, and, and when you when you look into you know, these performance enhancing tricks, like, you, like, would that, that really make you like LeBron more? I guess I don't know if it would make me like him more. I don't know if it would have an, an, an impact. I guess I would be impressed because I would know that he wasn't cheating. But. Yeah, I mean, you could say, and Pujols, I think, may have even offered to do this, but um, the greatest thing Peterson could have done last year, and maybe he didn't even know people were speculating about him, but just bring a cup of pee to work every day. Here's my pee. Feel free to test it. I'm 100% clean. I'm dying for an athlete to do that. Yeah. I mean, star, I do wonder some star though, athletes if, should if, do that. If Kobe came, if Kobe was the guy, for example, who said like, "I really want to get into blood testing or whatever," I, would, I, I just my belief is that then all the guys who are looking for an edge are like, "Okay, we can't do this. What can we do instead?" Well, I and think I just, yeah. I, I've always wanted to know why people don't think that blood doping would happen. Like in cycling, they do it for endurance. What would help NBA players more than being able to extend their endurance? Yes. Can you I don't, think of I don't anything? Feel like many, Stern is the only person making that argument. The only pe- Stern and people who somehow think that still are working from the perception that steroids just make you physically stronger. You take them and you're stronger and you're ripped. And that's like, that's not how it is. I mean, it's, you know. Well, here's the whole reason I wrote that column. 
And in the Baseball Hall of Fame, after what happened when nobody got in, that's what I knew I was going to write it at some point in January. Um, there's this perception that we stuck our head in the sands with McGuire and Sosa and everybody else. It almost seems like there's some residual guilt. And everybody's like, "Why? how did we not know? Why didn't we? And I think it's really strange that we feel that way about that era, but yet we do it now. And I don't know how to reconcile those two things. Do you feel that way? Um, well, I, I mean, the obvious answer is that, like, uh, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, it, now when we look back in that period of baseball, it seems obvious that something was going on. But when I, when it was actually happening, I was sort of thinking about the accomplishments themselves. I mean, the whole thing about Adrian Peterson, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about how this was happening. I was like, this is happening. Interesting, this is happening. I'm surprised yeah. this is happening. Um, you know, of course, if Adrian Peterson is proof, if it comes out later that he was doing all of these illegal things, well, then it will seem obvious. And everyone will be like, well, we were crazy for, you know, uh, somehow assuming a guy could have this surgery, you should, you know, this procedure should take him two years, takes him six months or and whatever. And we should mention Peyton um, Manning, too, as another one that somebody that it seemed impossible that he was going to come back when he did, and he did. So to me, those well, are the two that guys was, that... Know, that was that was like a neck, like a surgery to one's neck. I mean, so I... I, I yeah, but if you're having trouble throwing the football effectively, you're going to need enhancements. I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying that he, it was... Those were the two comebacks that we just we take comebacks at face value for the most part. Um, but what's interesting to me is in '98 the narrative now is that we knew the whole time, and I, I think we we knew something funky was going on. But remember, we also thought like the baseballs were juiced. It wasn't until Bonds's head started growing <laughs> that's when when Bonds's head actually started changing in size. That's when we knew yeah. something well, was well, up. He he just. The physical changes in him were so profound, and and it was, it, it, it uh, you know, it is odd. I mean, of course, it seems dumb now that McGuire's power numbers would go down and go up again. Um, although I, sometimes I guess that happens in reality. I don't know. I mean, some people have better careers at the end than they do in the middle. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I. You could say it's people putting their head in the sand. I guess I enjoy watching sports, and I don't think about this stuff quite as much as you do, I suspect. Well, yeah, it really doesn't, bo doesn't bother me as much. I mean, it's like a um, if uh, if I heard that, uh, that a ton of guys on the Ravens uh, tested positive for, for performance-enhancing drugs, it wouldn't make me think, like, that Super Bowl's invalid. I would be yeah. like, well... I guess that's how the world is now. Well, and then you could make the case that if it takes a certain whatever you're doing, a little help to help you reach heights that we aren't going to see normally. So, I, like, this is it's funny because the email breakdown that I got, and I got a ton of emails about that Friday column. Um, overwhelmingly, people were were fired up that I wrote it. And just really happy that somebody wrote it. And it was a lot, really mostly, thank God, finally somebody said something. And I thought it was going to be more polarizing and more people were going to be the other way upset. But um, one of the common refrains of the people who weren't against the fact that I wrote the column, but just kind of disagreed with the premise, was that, is it a bad thing to watch these guys push their limits? And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's a bad thing if, if it ends up with them dead. I mean, you look at pro wrestlers and steroid abuse and how many guys died of uh, some sort of heart-related illness over the last 30 years, and it's the list is, is absolutely insane. So if these guys are jeopardizing their health long-term, I would say that's a bad thing and it's not worth it. But if McGuire and Sosa and all these guys end up living into their 90s like anybody else would, then... I don't know. And I guess what, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to see how these this first group of guys age, as, as depressing as that sounds. Oh, that's, that's, it's, I, it's the same thing to a degree with concussions that we've talked about. I mean, that's really going to be uh, like the game-changing moment if all of a sudden people we're very familiar with 
uh, you know, speaking eloquently and, and, and seeming really sharp, if there's a whole generation of those guys who just drop off the cliff all at once, then people are really going to freak out. Well, and couldn't you say that? All right, we, we've noticed more concussions than ever. Players are unquestionably bigger and stronger and faster than ever. And when you look at NFL Network, will show sometimes games from the 1970s. The, the, there's just no correlation to the to what people look like then and now. And um, if people are bigger, stronger, faster, and they're getting more concussions, then it should seem like they should be more concerned why everybody is so much bigger and stronger and faster. And this is why I think Roger Goodell is a hypocrite. I really do. I think he picks and chooses what his little quote unquote battles are to try to get uh to whatever try to perception he's trying to create, it's bogus to me because if he really cares about the health of the players, then all of this is part of the same puzzle, which is when you have bigger, stronger, faster players who are hitting each other at warp speed and you don't really have stuff in place other than, hey, helmet helmet hits are bad. These guys are going to keep getting hurt, and he doesn't well, care. I mean, a puzzle actually is a really good analogy because it's sort of what it's like. It's like he's looking at the league as a, a thousand-piece puzzle. Yep. And there are many things wrong with with many individual pieces, but his goal is to remove those pieces without having anyone look at the puzzle and not recognize what it is. Right. Like if it's a puzzle of like a kitten hanging from a tree, they still have to know it's a kitten hanging from a tree. So how do we move, how do we remove pieces in a way that remove these problems that doesn't change the product? So when you say like he's a hypocrite, well, I suppose, I mean, kind of in the same way that like, you know, like, like Royce White accuses Daryl Morley of just being a capitalist and Daryl Morley is like, yes. I'm a capitalist. That's what right. I do. It's like you're saying Goodell's a hypocrite, and he kind of is. And maybe he would even admit that he is because he's trying to do two things at once. He's trying to continue the popularity of something riddled with problems. Right. So I mean, well, you know how how do you consistently present your league as great and successful if you know it has all these these you know kind of profound issues in it? Well, you just sort of talk about the profound issues in ways that that to mitigate each other. Well, I'm going to keep talking about this stuff. And over the next couple of months, I'm going to have different people on the BS report. Um, I want to have Howard Bryant. I mean, why I, don't I would think what you could do, Bill, is you could just put out a challenge to some athlete to come into Grantland and be drug tested. I just, I don't know why a, you don't do that. If he, that's what you keep asking for. I feel like somebody would, if you said, Hey, this is what we're doing. If you're a professional athlete and you're clean and you want to prove it, Come to Grantland. We will test you, and uh, you know, and and we will make the results public uh, to the people. You know, people will know you're clean. Then, okay, let's do it. Challenge accepted. It. Challenge extended. And <laughs> I also want to have a bunch of. I don't. I fully admit that I don't know enough about PDs. I think I know enough for the average person, but I, I really want to know like exactly what's going on and just like. The amount of emails I got over the last week and the things I learned just about stuff like the, uh, I, the thing that happened in Spain, which I didn't even know about, Operacion something, where you basically had all these, um, Spanish cyclists and it might have extended to other athletes and there's stuff going on I didn't know. And my, I'm just going to try to get more educated over the next few months because I think this is the single, in my opinion, this is the single most important issue in sports right now is that we don't know what these guys are doing, and we don't even know if, if we should be judging them for what they're doing. So um, you and I are probably going to have more conversations about this, I'm guessing. Chuck probably Osterman. So. One last thing. Yeah. Have you listened to the new My Bloody Valentine record? No. Is, how oh, good is good. it? It's really good. I like it. <laughs> but just La I ask you. <laughs> oh, la last, last, last thing. Are you watching every episode of Girls? Yeah, I've seen the first uh, eight episodes because right. uh, we have screeners. Yeah, I am. All right. Well, let, next time, let's, I want that needs to be one of the things we discuss. Check close. Are you in. watching? Are you watching House of Cards? No, but I'm going to. Yeah, I, I would think you'd like it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to watch it. Chuck Klosterman, a pleasure as always. I will talk to you soon, my friend. Bye bye. Target the channel.
Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.